Alex Cohen and uh, Dimitri Zakharov, two fantastic PhD students from MIT. Dima, you probably met already. Alex, unfortunately, didn't make it here. Uh, so the, the topic is the Hilbron Triangle problem, uh, some recent developments, and I'll start uh, gentle by introducing the problem, say, say some things about the history and uh, the, some of the ideas that motivated the, the, the new result. So what is this problem? Given a natural number n, uh, one can ask about the following quantity. What is the smallest function delta, delta of n, uh, such that in every configuration of endpoints and the unit square, there always exists a triangle of area at most delta. So delta, uh, smallest area that you can find in every configuration of endpoints in the square. So let's 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 uh, get a sense of what what this function is for small small numbers. Uh, when n equals four, this this uh, so we have four points in the square. What's, what's the smallest area? Always you can find a, a triangle of area at most one half. And this, this can be seen immediately by just splitting up the picture into two triangles. Uh, it doesn't really matter if the four points are in convex position or concave position, you always can draw something. The, the two triangles have disjoint interiors and the, the full area of the square is one. So definitely one, one triangle of area at most one half. Uh, this is also, one half is also the smallest number for which the sentence is true. We should take the corners of the square, then definitely uh, all the triangles have area uh, uh, one half. So you cannot really improve on this quantity. Uh, so it's it's a, like like many other functions in extremal combinatorics. It's it's uh, uh, kind of hard to determine its values for small uh, n. Also, here are some pictures. So long from uh, uh, that world Wolfram, I think. Uh, with, with the extremal configurations, uh, the, best, the best known configurations for small n. So uh, for n equals five, I think the answer is known. For n equals six, uh, it's also known. Starting with n at least seven, I think these are just the best known and they're not matching upper bounds. So pictures look like this. They have all sorts of symmetry, but kind of hard to, to understand what, what are the patterns. Uh, what about uh, larger configurations? So kind of the story starts with uh, a remarkable construction of Erdos from the early 50s, maybe before in writing it's from the 50s. So one can construct a set of endpoints in the unit square so that all the triangles have area at least a constant times one over n squared. So uh, the construction is, uh, is algebraic. It's quite pretty. Essentially, it's a risk scaled modular parabola. So the idea is that if you take points on, uh, on a parabola, there is no tricollinear. So in particular, if you take the set of points x over p, y over p, where p is a prime between n and 2n, uh, where x and y range from zero to p minus one, and y is x squared. So this, these are uh, some points in the unit square after this rescaling, still don't have three collinear. And, uh, and the triangles have large area because, well, the dilate of this picture, the dilate by p, is, uh, is a configuration of points that have integer coordinates. And, and uh, the area of a triangle with integer coordinates is at least one half. So the area of any triangle determined by three vertices in X must, uh, must be at least uh, one over two times this, uh, the scaling factor P squared. And uh, so this, this is at least uh, a constant times one over N squared given the choice of P. So this is a, this is a nice construction and it's not really the only construction. So it's possible to construct configurations with all triangles of area at least the constant one over n squared probabilistically one can take n points at random and delete really uh, one one vertex from each triangle that has an area of uh, area at most one one over n squared and if one analyzes this uh, deletion argument uh, rather straightforwardly you still get a construction matching the same uh, quantitative bound so it's possible to do a greedy construction choosing endpoints greedily also leads to uh, a configuration uh, with the same feature. And so it was uh, this, this aspect of the problem that motivated Hilbron in the late 40s, early 50s, to conjecture that maybe maybe this, this one over n squared should be the correct order of the magnitude for the problem. So uh, maybe it's true that uh, there are some absolute constants, little c and big c, such that this function is between these two expressions. Um, uh, however, this turned out to be false. Uh, so rather famously, in, in, in the early 80s, Komlos, uh, Pins, and Semeredi uh, managed to construct endpoints in the unit square such that all the triangles have area at least one over n squared times some factor of log. And uh, 
this, uh, this is an important result. The proof is one of the highlights, still one of the highlights of the semi random method in XML combinatorics. It's a random construction, like the deletion one that I described earlier, but uh, the analysis is a bit more careful. So it involves results about independence numbers in, uh, three, uniform, four, in three uniform hypergraphs that are locally sparse. Um, of course, uh, since, well, it's a disproof of a conjecture that's just by a factor of log, as it happens, uh, Erdos conjectured immediately right after that, uh, okay, maybe the correct conjecture is with log, log of n over n squared. And this, uh, this has still remained to the day an open problem. Um, okay, today's talk will be, however, about upper bounds. So let's, let's switch gears and, and instead of trying to construct configurations with all triangles having large areas, Let's start with an arbitrary configuration and ask, okay, what's a small area triangle that I can always find there? Uh, so let's start somewhere with, with, with an easy bound. I give you any endpoints. Uh, I claim there's always a triangle of area at most one over N. Several ways to do this. I won't dwell too much. You just fix a point and draw triangles from it to the rest. So you can draw N minus two triangles that have disjoint interiors. Fix from a vertex. Then, uh, well, again, they add up. The, the total area adds up to something at most one. And uh, there is a triangle of area, one over n minus two. So this is, this is nice and easy. There, as I said, there are other ones. Um, however, perhaps what's maybe surprising if, if you're seeing this problem for the first time, it's not easy at all to improve upon this uh, easy estimate. In fact, uh, here's a quick challenge. Uh, I'll leave you 30 seconds or a minute. Can you find maybe a triangle of area little of one over n? So just a little bit better. I'll uh, try to uh, procrastinate telling you the next, uh, next step of the story by maybe uh, drawing your attention towards some important geometric facts that we'll use today. So uh, what's the most important fact that we'll use today? The area of a triangle is half times the base times the height of the triangle. Uh, in particular, uh, this leads to the following nice observation. If I'm interested in small area triangles, let's say triangles of area at most A, and I fix two vertices of my configuration X and Y, well, the set of points Z in the plane that form a triangle with X and Y of area at most A is uh, uh, a strip whose width I can understand because of this area formula. So it's, it's, a width, uh, it's a strip um, centered uh, on this line supporting the, the pair XY that has a width four times A divided by the length of the segment X minus Y. Uh, so here's, here's, here's an immediate corollary in the, in the context of the, the Hilbron triangle problem. If, if delta denotes this quantity, the smallest area that you can find in, in your configuration P of N points, if I draw these strips for every pair of points, X and Y, so I, I have my pair X and Y, and I draw the strip of that width around it, and I do this for every pair, uh, these strips must be quite deplete of points. They don't really have anything else other than X and Y. Anything inside here would make a triangle of area less than delta. Uh, and delta by design uh, is the smallest area or is something like that uh, for which a triangle exists. So you have these empty strips there. Uh, okay, I think maybe a minute past. Uh, uh, it is possible to improve on this trivial bound. And uh, this was a really beautiful breakthrough result of Roth from the early 50s. So he managed to show that indeed there is a triangle of area little of one over N. Uh, the argument uh, is a very nice density increment argument that in some sense starts with this final observation from the previous slide. Uh, you have these empty strips uh, around every, uh, every pair of points of that width, and uh, they cut out a significant portion of the area of the square. And so it makes, it, make, it seems uh, sensible to maybe look at the complement of these strips inside the square. There are still many points left. Maybe one can find a square where there's an increased density. Uh, this strategy is not, not easy to implement at all. In fact, it doesn't work at all for squares if, if one, one poses the problem like this. But it's really a, 
the beginning of this argument. And it's an argument that uh, should resemble the Roth's other theorem on the maximum size of a set of one up to n without three term arithmetic progressions. In fact, this, this result is the precursor of, uh, of that theorem. It only appeared two years earlier. Um, uh, I won't say more about this density increment argument, although it's in some sense important uh, for, for, uh, for us, but a bit more indirectly. I will uh, move forward 20 years. So not much progress has been made on, on the upper bound side of the problem until Schmidt in the 70s managed to improve on this uh, rot argument, which was quite quantitative. In fact, the numerology is somewhat tantalizingly similar to the, the bound for Roth's theorem about three AP free sets. Just a coincidence. Uh, however, uh, so uh, like like this problem, uh, like like that problem, this one got improved also. So Schmidt in seventy two managed to turn this log log double log of n into a log of n, and the argument uh, represents really an important moment for this problem. I think also an important moment for us. It's really uh, an argument that kind of sets the right perspective for this problem. Namely, it's, 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 uh, it's after this paper, this problem becomes really a problem in incidence geometry. So I wanna sketch a little bit this, uh, what, what, what Schmidt is doing. Um, the idea is quite simple. I won't really care too much about going over the details, but at least the setup. So what Schmidt did was the following. Um, if uh, if uh, I start with my set of points P in the unit square, it seems again very tempting to construct these uh, these uh, these strips uh, for every pair of points of the of the previous width. So this four times delta over over the 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 length of the segment of the corresponding pair. Before I had the four, and now I'm putting a, a, another constant c to be decided later. Uh, it won't really be as important to me that these strips are empty, other than the generators. Um, however, uh, it's important that the width is close to that critical threshold. And what Schmidt did was define an incidence graph for this problem. So uh, you have these strips, also uh, I will call them interchangeably tubes. And uh, I can consider the incidence graph between the sets of points in the unit square and uh, these, uh, these tubes. Uh, so maybe I should... Or something. So here, the points of the square, this L will be uh, my set of tubes. Okay, so imagine the points here, imagine vertices here corresponding to these tubes. So this is, uh, let's say, generated by the pair tau, this width, the distance, uh, the length of the segment between the two points of the pair. And uh, it's not just going to be a, a simple incidence graph. A, a normal incidence graph would be a graph where I draw an edge between a point in the square and uh, in the tube if the point is in the tube. I'm also going to weight it appropriately. I'm going to weight it by the, the width of the corresponding strip it sees on the right. Okay, so I'm going to put this. Uh, times delta divided by d of tau uh, as a weight for each edge. Any questions about the setup, the notation? I think it's a very cute, uh, cute argument. So I would like to maybe uh, have it safe. The edge is one x is in the two. Uh, sorry, the- So edge x t would- Yeah, this is a point in the square and this is a tube. Yeah. This is repeat. The edge is uh, if x is, uh, yeah, 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 it's an element that's, that lies in the tube, exactly. This is x, and this is t. Uh, I must have a picture of that. Excellent. Okay, so kind of the, the, the main observation, although it wasn't really phrased like that uh, at the time, uh, is that this incidence graph has bounded degree if it's weighted accordingly. Uh, so for every, at least on, on one side, for every, for every point in the square, the, the sum of the weights of the corresponding edges coming out of X 
bounded by a constant. I sum up these numbers. Some of the weights is at most one. Uh, so this this uh, this uh, involves some 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 uh, geometric reasoning. It's quite uh, quite neat. I'm not sure uh, to what extent I should do it, but uh, kind of the point behind in the considering these uh, these widths is that uh, if I fix a point X, uh, two tubes through X of that width cannot really overlap too much in uh, inside the square. So if I have here, uh, not scale, but let's say I have here a unit segment, it can be one half, let's say one half. So these are not the generators of these strips. This is just the point X I'm interested in bounding and controlling the degree of. And uh, uh, I claim that I cannot really have two of these strips uh, sharing X and also sharing a point Y that's at a constant distance from X, simply because if I put down the generators with the four strips, well, that would mean, um, that there is a small area triangle between those four generators if I choose that constant C appropriately in the definition. Very easy to check. So uh, if that doesn't happen, well, I have a picture like this. If I draw a circle with radius one half X, I have these strips containing X and they really don't overlap any, uh, at distance one half. So I draw all these strips that contain X. Uh, the sum of their widths must be at most the circumference of the circle if these strips are disjoint. So why there is not a point in set B? Why some outer point? This, okay. is, this is for any point in the square. I look at all the strips containing it. The sum of their widths is bounded by something involving pi. This, uh, this is the claim here. The strips can intersect, the strips can intersect uh, but not, uh, so they can intersect somewhere here, but not, uh, not too far apart. They can intersect the boundary. Little bit the boundary. Yeah, they cannot intersect the, the this is a circle of, of, uh, of radius one half. Intersection on the boundary would mean a picture like this. It's just, okay. a, just, a, just, a, just a sketch. Uh, Anyway, so uh, with something like this, one has a very good understanding of the number of edges of the graph, right? Uh, I can upper bound number of edges weighted in, in a weighted sense by just summing these degrees and using this bound. And then all one has to do is uh, exchange signs. So this is summing over all the vertices, taking an integral over all the x's in the square, exchanging the sum in the integral. And uh, the integral of the characteristic function of a tube, right, is really the, uh, the area that, uh, the tube intersects in the square. So this is uh, comes out to be the sum of the squares of the corresponding widths. And uh, this is bounded by a constant because the degrees are bounded by a constant. But now the widths are here, they involve delta. This, uh, this part of the argument does not really involve delta anymore. One can extract an upper bound for delta just in terms of this quantity that is uh, the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of distances over all the points in, in, uh, in P. These quantities have been studied for a while in analysis. They're called Ries energies. So this is the two Ries energy or minus two Ries energy, depending on who you talk to. And uh, this is at least n squared times log n. One can prove this uh, without too much trouble. <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's Schmidt's argument. As you see, uh, it doesn't really use any sophisticated geometry. So the point of me, Sharing this is that uh, uh, you can maybe put yourself in our shoes. When, when we saw an argument uh, like this, we uh, definitely thought that, okay, maybe there's been so much uh, advancement in, in incident geometry. Maybe one can use uh, more sophisticated tools from incident geometry to improve on this argument. It seems a bit uh, unsophisticated to upper bound the number of edges in an incidence graph by upper bound by using a bound on the degrees, uniform bound on the degrees. Uh, of course, Roth also had this idea before, even though there was no incidence geometry available at the time. Uh, in fact, right after the same year, um, 
he essentially uh, indirectly invented the whole, reinvented the whole area. Uh, uh, this is 10 years before the Semery Protter theorem as a, as a point of reference. Uh, so uh, right after Roth managed to uh, dramatically improve on this bound of Schmidt and show that there is an absolute constant mu such that delta of n is at most this one over n to the power one plus mu. So there is uh, a triangle of uh, polynomially smaller area than, than, uh, than Schmidt was able to find with this, uh, this argument I sketched. So, um, okay. Um, Roth's bound like before was, was uh, quantitative. He found an explicit exponent mu. This was this, uh, this, this thing that's close to 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.105, I should maybe say, because all of them are 0.1. Um, then Roth subsequently wrote the second paper where he optimized for the, uh, several things in the argument, um, getting this, this exponent to be 0.117. And then uh, in 83, Komlo, Spins, and Semeridi uh, managed to reach a natural limit of Roth's method, showing that you can always find a triangle of area one over n to the eight over seven. So uh, yeah, my plan today is to uh, give you a sense about uh, this claim that this is indeed this eight over seven is, is, a, is a natural limit in, in uh, Rod's method. In some sense, it's an optimization of, uh, of, of this method as, pre, as known up to 83 or, or later. Um, and uh, maybe put this into a slightly different, different perspective. Um, so our result manages to just uh, break this exponent by a little bit. So in, in recent joint work with Alex and Dima, we show that there is a triangle of area, uh, most one over this n to the eight over seven, but now you also have a plus one over 2000. Of course, this one over 2000 is not really uh, important uh, on its own. We didn't really try too, too much to, to get the best, best exponent there, but it is a, it, any exponent that you can get with our method will be a, a small number of that sort, yes. What is the next natural barrier? I, I, will, I will maybe discuss some of these things. It's a good question, of course. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'd like, uh, like to tell you about ROT setup and uh, what we do to uh, go a bit beyond what he did. However, I thought it would be uh, maybe a good moment to take a break between uh, <laughs> for, uh, with, uh, with points and strips for, for another two, three minutes and maybe discuss a little bit uh, some product phenomenon and projection theory because uh, our result, this exponent, uh, it's funny shape uh, is uh, an a manifestation of Burgen's discretized some product theorem. So, uh, uh, and uh, imp th that's implicitly and explicitly it comes from recent developments in projection theory. So I'd like to tell you about uh, these two things. I know this is a mixed audience. Uh, I know there are many people in additive combinatorics here that are very familiar with some product phenomena. However, I won't really talk about maybe the standard some product question due to Erdos and Semeredi from the 80s. I will go even uh, more back to uh, the first question of this nature as far as I know by Erdos, who was interested, I think all of his life in, in some product type questions. Uh, so this is a question of Erdos and Boltman that I think really uh, started, started this business, a really beautiful question that I wish I knew maybe er uh, earlier in my life, so I wanted to share it. Um, uh, so what, what they asked was the following, uh, is there any Borel measurable subring of the real numbers that has di intermediate dimension? So dimension between zero and one. Uh, the notion of dimension that uh, will be everywhere present today uh, will be Hausdorff dimension. I won't really define it for you because it's a technical definition, won't really be important. So I will just maybe say some examples instead. So the rational numbers is the subring to, to have in mind that has Hausdorff dimension zero. The set of real numbers has Hausdorff dimension one. And this question is about, is there other, any other interesting ring in between the rationals and the real numbers, it has some the dimension that's between strictly zero and one. Is that for measurable subgroups? Is that 
Yeah, so this is an excellent question. This is why uh, the, the answer to that question has to do with why we add this Borel. If we remove Borel, there are indeed uh, examples that are, you can use axiom of choice and construct something pathological. That's not very interesting. So that's, that's why Erdos and Bowman added, um, added Borel. Uh, if you don't like this formulation, uh, so, so uh, uh, imprecise, you can ask, you can think, okay, what about, uh, think, uh, pick your favorite number between zero and one. Uh, like uh, one half or log two over log three. I say log two over log three because I want I want to give you another example. So take for instance. Uh, so what what else is there, right? Other than rationals and uh, and uh, real numbers. Think about the middle third Cantor set, for example. So that's a, that's a set with uh, with dimension log two over log three. Uh, I want uh, I must. I Think most of you are familiar with that. I won't really draw it. I just want to uh, maybe I'll draw one one layer uh, below, and you continue take the intersection of all of them. Um, why am I mentioning this? So it's not really a good candidate automatically to be a subring of the real numbers. Of course, if you had two numbers in the counter set that are closer to the endpoint here, well, the sum will escape this. But it seems conceivable, right? That uh, if you take translates of this counter set, you cover the real line with, with uh, the set, you can maybe make it uh, closed under addition. You can even make it closed under the multiplication. So this is really the spirit of this question. Can you, do, can you come, come up with a sub ring from, from a counter like object like that? So it's a really beautiful question and it turns out uh, uh, deeper, even deeper than it looks. It was settled famously in the negative by uh, Edgar and Miller in 2003 using Mars trans projection theorem. Uh, so Mars trans projection theorem is the statement that, so it's, it's, it's really uh, a work that's again, part of a very influential paper and in, in, in analysis really started the whole area that's known today as projection theory. So this is an area that studies dimensions of projections of fractals. Uh, so the first thing that you can ask uh, when, when you put those words together is, okay, I give you a, a a set in, in R2, that's Borel again, to avoid the uh, pathologies. And uh, you look at the projections of a set uh, in, in, in various directions. So let's take uh, a generic direction, uh, theta. And I project my set onto, onto this line through the origin and that has angle theta. What, what can I say about the dimension of this projection? Definitely does not grow. Projection is this Lipschitz map. Uh, so uh, that cannot increase the dimension. But what's remarkable is that the dimension of the projection actually matches the dimension of the original set for almost every direction. Uh, so this is a really nice result. And even more, if you know that the set is uh, more than one dimensional to begin with, then uh, 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 the projection even has positive Lebesgue measure. So it's not just that uh, it will have dimension one, we can say something a bit more. So uh, this was also proved famously by Bourguin with a much more complicated proof. He was unaware of the work by Edward Miller. The paper came out roughly at the same time. Uh, he was motivated by a set of conjectures of Katz and Tao uh, that are stated like this uh, very articulately in the paper. It's one of my favorite papers. So I had to like uh, uh, put it like that. Uh, so, what uh, Katz and Tao studied in this paper was a series of conjectures related to this uh, erdos volkmar ring conjecture uh, that seemed to be quite related to each other. So uh, these conjectures, and I won't really put the full list, but these are Falconer, the distance set conjecture, in particular, the, the statement that if I have a compact set in R2, let's say nice set in R2, that has dimension at least one, and you look at the set of distinct distances as a set of the real numbers, the set of distinct distance has dimension at least one half plus some constant. Uh, so this, this is a particular case of the Falconer distance set conjecture. Uh, there's also the Furstenberg set problem. This is related to continuous versions of semi Trotter theorem, also Kakea theorem, Kakea conjecture, sorry. Um, so this uh, particular statement is that half Furstenberg sets have dimension at least one plus C. Half Furstenberg set means a set in R2, nice set again. It has this feature that uh, for every direction, there's a line that hits the set in a half dimensional set at least. So, and it's a claim about such a set must be large. Um, 
So what Katzenthal uh, proved in this paper is that these certain discretized version of these continuous statements are all equivalent to each other. And uh, in this alternate proof of, uh, of uh, the erdos bolkman ring conjecture, Bulgan managed to uh, show these discretized uh, versions, thus improving uh, the discretized version of these that imply the continuous versions. I am mentioning this because, uh, so like, I, like I said, uh, 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 this, this Bourguin, uh, discretized sum product theorem has been since connected to many different other parts of mathematics. And today, uh, essentially talking about another, another topic that has been affected by, by this theorem. So let me get back to the Hilbron triangle problem. Uh, mention this incident setup that's behind these polynomial improvements. And uh, what does it have to do with projection theory? So uh, the setup is the following. I start with my set of points. And uh, okay, I wanna find uh, small area triangle. So again, the area formula is my friend. Uh, I know that uh, it will be good if I find pairs of points that are close to each other. And it will be great if when I draw tubes generated by those pairs of points, uh, tubes of a certain width W, if I can catch some point uh, that's different from the generators in that tube, then, well, I know I will have found a triangle that has area U times W, essentially, up to constants. So it seems uh, uh, very sensible to define uh, the following incidence count. So I will, uh, for a parameter U, I take all the lines passing through the pairs at distance at most U, and I define the uh, the number of incidences between the points P in my original configuration and the tubes generated by L that have uh, with W. Okay, um, so concretely, uh, what, what I said earlier, if uh, I can show that the number of incidences between these points and tubes uh, is at least two times the number of lines for a certain choice, of parameter WF, W final, uh, then this, uh, I will have found an additional incidence, a non-trivial incidence, a point that lies in, in, in a new, uh, new tube of, of, uh, of width W final, giving me an upper bound for delta. So that's kind of the basic, the basic strategy. And uh, what was uh, Roth's uh, take on this pre-incidence geometry days? So he said, okay, let's pick two different scales, two different parameters for W for this, this width. And uh, let's try to do the following. It would be great if I can start with some maybe more modest width, initial width W sub I, for which I know for sure there are many incidences. Many meaning uh, as you would expect if the, num if the set of points and the set of lines were uniformly at random. In, 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 uh, in the square. In this case, uh, tubes of width W sub i would have uh, the expected number of points in them would be W sub i times P, the number of points in the square. So uh, it would be nice if I can find uh, an initial estimate of that nature. And then for some smaller, more refined scale W sub f, maybe I can show that the normalized incidence count uh, at scale w, w final does not change too much from the normalized uh, incidence count at scale W initial. And if I have these two, of course I can uh, repeat and hope to find the smallest W sub f uh, for which I still find incidences at some later scale. Yes. I um, yes, yes. No, no, this is not, this is up to, actually the same notation here, I apologize. Oh, no. It's not too important, but let's, let's, uh, let's say these are the same. The uh, first, these are all big O, <laughs> big O and big gamma, I apologize. Yes, thank you. You guys saying this pick WF is less and less than there is, is not constant or it's just a little uh, This will end up being, with, and not just, a, yeah, it will be much smaller than W sub i. So you should think for the record, this close to constant, the function of n was close to constant, and this, this it will be, you will aim for something small. The second lesson must have big over the first one. Yeah, but for, for now you can just uh, think about this. 
I'm not hiding console, just a smaller scale. Uh, and uh, it's a rough strategy. Nothing is uh, really done yet. Uh, so what, what the picture kind of looks like this. Uh, you have these hopefully tubes with W sub i that have several points. And then the hope will be to find some W sub f where the tubes still generate by the same, uh, by the same lines, but thinner will still have plenty of incidences. Um, so uh, like I was saying, this was not really stated at all in terms of um, uh, incidences. At the time, um, Roth was, an, I mean, as an analytic number theorist, he uh, proved an inequality that kind of served the purpose of, of what this one is describing using uh, Selberg's inequality, so inspired by the large sieve uh, type inequalities from number theory. Uh, so it was more of an L2 uh, kind of relation between, between uh, these normalized counts. I won't really get too much into that. Um, uh, I will maybe st state things directly uh, the way we think about them. Uh, so our first maybe uh, contribution is that uh, we kind of rephrase Roth's uh, approach regarding the inductive step as uh, a more modern, in terms of a more modern kind of development in harmonic analysis called the high-low method. This was introduced by Good Solomon and Wang in, uh, in 2019, which is again, roughly the same thing, uh, but uh, uh, serving maybe, you know, one, one formulation might seem more natural to um, to some than, than to others. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. And then uh, uh, number two is our main contribution, which is uh, a new approach regarding the initial estimate, which comes from uh, uh, direction set estimates from projection theory. So, um, uh, so far, uh, maybe I should mention here, maybe so far all these, uh, um, polynomial improvement starting with Roth, ending with Komlosh in similarity, uh, optimized, uh, improved, and finally optimized the inductive step and all relied on the same initial estimate input that goes back to Roth's original paper. And uh, so our gain ultimately will come from an improvement for step A. Okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, um, the inductive step first. So uh, the inductive step and the high-low method. I remind you briefly the setup. So I have this incidence configuration from before and two scales. So W final less than W initial. Uh, I would like to state more precisely an inequality that relates the normalized incidence count at one scale with normalized incidence count at another scale. Uh, it's uh, uh, the following. So uh, the absolute value of the difference is at most a constant times this expression that involves uh, two new uh, quantities. So for a given scale W, MP of W is the maximum number of points that you see in uh, W by W square, maximum number of points from P and that you see in the configuration. And ML of W, this is the maximum number of, uh, of, of lines that you see in the, in the the W by one tube. I should perhaps clarify here when I say that uh, that the line is contained in the W by one tube. I don't really care about the full line. I only care about its intercept on the square. So I care about where the line intersects the square. And that portion, I'm interested in how many of those intercepts lie in, in a tube of dimensions W uh, and one. Those are these quantities. And so this, this, uh, this difference between normalized instance is controlled by the square root uh, product of these two quantities divided by P times L times this uh, final scale. Uh, in words, what does this inequality mean? Is that, uh, well, if the set of points and the set of lines you start with are not too concentrated, then this renormalized uh, incidence count does not change as you vary the scale too much. So if these things, these things are small, the error term is small. The configuration is not concentrated. Um, some words about the proof. I won't get too, uh, too much into it. It's uh, a very beautiful, simple idea, but it takes, takes some effort to, uh, to run this. Uh, I should say that maybe, uh, again, the proof is not 
not entirely new. It's really a combination of the Roth argument and, and uh, what, what happens in good Solomon Wang. Uh, Roth, perhaps curiously, so being interested in the Hilbron triangle problem, use an inequality like this, an L2 kind of type inequality like this, to lower bound incidences at a smaller scale in terms of incidences at, uh, at, at a bigger scale, whereas good Solomon Wang are interested in upper bounds for incidences. So they, they, it's more, it's a paper more in the style of the usual uh, uh, papers in, uh, in incident geometry that study upper bounds for incidences between points and tubes. Um, and this is an equality that kind of captures both sides of the story. Uh, so it, it's both an upper bound and a lower bound at the same time. But of course, like Roth, we really care about lower bounding this quantity in terms of the, the first one. So what's really the idea? Uh, if you stare long enough at this uh, difference, it's really an inner product. It's an absolute value of an inner product. Uh, inner product between two functions. So this one function is kind of like uh, the sum of characteristic functions of the points in P. However, it's a bit, uh, bit smoother and to make the L2 norm of this function small in order to apply all these tools, you want really small norms. Uh, so you replace the characteristic function of a point with the characteristic function maybe of a ball center at that point that has radius W final. Um, and the second function is this difference in characteristic functions. So it's a sum over all the lines in L and you're looking at um, characteristic function of a tube generated by L at scale initial, W initial, minus the characteristic function of the tube generated by L at scale W final, uh, renormalized appropriately, so that uh, these things are actually orthogonal functions. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the driving force behind this is cauchy schwarz of course, uh, this, this, this inner product can be controlled as follows. And then the L2 norm of G is upper bounded by, yes? Why is it called Hilo? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question, especially I think uh, after our paper, because the, the way we state, we do things is completely on the physical side. Uh, the correct answer is that this inner product here, actually, uh, so the, what, what this upper bound is doing can also be reinterpreted on the, on, the, on the frequency side as a decomposition between high frequencies and low frequencies. You can split this up. Uh, it has a natural Fourier analytic uh, analog after applying Parseval and so on. Uh, you don't really need this. Uh, so one can proceed with cauchy parts on the physical side and then try to understand the L2 norm of G and the L2 norm of, uh, of phi separately. The L2 norm of G will involve this ultimately, MP the maximum number of points at, at the final scale. And uh, this, uh, this L2 norm of phi will involve ML and this uh, understanding of the L2 norm of ML is a bit more subtle. This uses the orthogonality of these functions. And uh, this is where you have this high frequency, low frequency decomposition on the, on the frequency side. Um, on the physical side, you just split in terms of uh, how large are the angles between pairs of lines when you expand this out, the square of that. <clears throat> Any other questions about uh, the inductive step? I uh, will uh, move on to the initial estimate. Uh, okay, so that's all I want to say about the inductive step. So let me say some things about the initial estimate. So, uh, this is where projection theory comes in. So let me at least hopefully get to that. Um, so I'll, I'll describe some opening moves. So remember where our goal is to find small area triangles. And we start with pairs of points at this, we, at, we have two parameters to worry about, right? Pairs of point, uh, the distances between pairs of points and heights. So widths of, widths of cubes. And it's kind of hard to control both at the same time, ensuring that both are small. So uh, uh, it's, uh, good to put one, fix one from the beginning so that you don't really stress out uh, about it uh, as much for the rest of the argument. Roth begins by fixing widths of tubes. Uh, we proceed by fixing the parameter U. So the upper bound on the, on the distances between pairs of points we consider uh, in the line set. So fix some U and let's partition uh, the, the square 
as an opening move uh, into smaller u by u squares, axis parallel, okay? And uh, okay, here's a way to ensure that uh, pairs of points have distance at most u, or if you want uh, u root two, but we don't really care that much about constants. We will only focus on sets of pairs of points that, uh, that are in the same square. So I look at, I look at each square q at the time, and I look at pairs of points there. They're close to each other, at distance at most q. So I have a picture like this. I, I draw squares, and through each uh, pair of points in the same square, I draw this cube of some width w sub i, parameter that I have to actually stress about now. Um, so what, what will be this, uh, this parameter w sub i? I would like to pick w sub i to be sufficiently large compared to u, such that um, I can actually hope to find many incidences between, uh, between these tubes of this width and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and the points in P. So the tubes that I'm considering again are the tubes that have generating lines, lines passing through two points in the same square. And this is the, the width that I'm fixing w sub i. And notice that, okay, if I want an initial estimate, so if I want this, uh, the incidences between the points and the tubes to uh, be large as expected, it would be really nice if for each, uh, or if for, for most tubes, for most lines in the union of, uh, of these line sets, one coming from each square. So for each line in the picture, it would be nice if the number of points in the corresponding tube is at least this W sub i times P. It would be really great because I then can sum up the contribution for each line. And of course, I don't care if, if it's just a constant proportion of the lines, uh, that's still good for me to get a good initial estimate. So I would like at least to eyeball some large width that, uh, that uh, can hope to achieve something like this. It won't be easy, but notice that because this width is uh, large compared to you, if, if I try to set things up this way, then notice that um, uh, this, uh, uh, this is really a, a problem about the directions of the lines determined by these, uh, these squares there. So a, a tube like this is really de determined by the direction of this line rather than how uh, the, this translation, translational offset here. Uh, if you change, if you, if, if, you, if you shift this line a little bit, you're gonna still get a tube that has like huge overlap with this tube if this W sub i is quite close, close to you. So this is really ensuring this, this lower bound on the incidence is really a, a problem about directions. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's, that, that's, that's the, first, the first idea. Perhaps one can reduce this uh, initial estimate problem, defining a, a scale W sub i, which we have an instance to a problem about understanding the set of direction span by these lines inside these squares. And indeed it's possible to, to show that uh, one, can, one can show that uh, for most squares in this picture, um, there, if you just focus on the directions of the tubes now, there are not too many directions for these W sub i tubes uh, that contain few points. So this is just a, an easy double counting line. If you forget, if you zoom out a little bit and forget about directions of these lines and just think about, uh, I have the square and I have tubes containing the square. And I claim that for most squares, there are not many directions that have few points from the configuration. Um, okay, that's, that's something we can do. However, there's still possibly uh, directions where tubes have few points. And uh, I have to, really stress about um, the possibility of my lines from LQ being concentrated in these bad directions. It could be that these, there are many good directions for tubes going here, going here that contain many points from, from Q, but uh, um, or many points from P, but it could be that uh, these directions are bad and most of the lines are concentrated in those bad directions. Um, so this can happen. However, uh, it doesn't happen if the intersection of P with Q is uh, an S-dimensional set for some S strictly greater than one. Yes. I'll get to that in a second. So uh, this is a different different argument. Soon, sooner or later, we'll see it will lead to a different proof for the eight over seven, the way I'm stating things. It's a bit different than their uh, initial estimate. So this is this is not how they do their initial estimate at all. They start with tubes that have many points and they struggle to find pairs of points inside them that are close to each other. They kind of do the opposite. 
Yes. So this can be made uh, precise. Uh, so the, the key input is this Marstrand theorem that kind of uh, is related to the first theorem. It's from the same very the same paper from 54. So if you have a set, a Borel set in R2 that has dimensions strictly greater than one, uh, then the set of directions. So I think about the direct radial, the directions as points as on, on, on the unit circle. Uh, the set of directions uh, is full dimensional. So it, it's a subset of S1. It definitely has dimension at most one. The claim is that if the original set has dimension bigger than one, then the set of direction has Hausdorff dimension equal to one. Um, um, so this is a continuous statement. We would like to use it for our finite problem. So uh, and we reverse engineer that story from, from the uh, erdos bogman conjecture. We really need this technology to serve the purposes of a finite problem. Uh, and so uh, we kind of use discretization um, to, to borrow this. Uh, what is, uh, we need a definition. So what, uh, what is the discrete version of a, of a S-dimensional set? Uh, if I give you a set of points, finite set of points, possibly, uh, you say that P is as regular above scale delta if the following condition is satisfied for all squares of length uh, W. So uh, the intersection of P with any W by W square is controlled by this, uh, by this right-hand side expression. And then discrete version of Marstrand says that, well, if this intersection of P with, with, the, with the square in my, my, in my naive partition from the beginning is as regular for some S greater than one, the set of directions is quite spread out. It cannot really be like in the picture on the left. So uh, this means something along the following lines. If I count the number of lines in LQ that point into an interval of directions, I, then it's at most a constant times what you'd expect if, uh, if the lines would be random. <clears throat> um, so this, uh, this is true for every interval of directions of, of length at least delta. Here are some quick, uh, quick pictures. I won't really have time to stare at them with you. Uh, so on the left, you have a two regular set. Marstrand theorem here tells you that the direction set. So you should draw pairs, uh, lines through pairs of points and you look uh, what are the directions. They're quite spread out and hopefully it's believable if the picture looks like this. This is a one regular set, one dimensional set. Marstrand theorem in this case does not really say anything. Perhaps it's not so easy to see uh, in this picture but there are of course other much easier examples of one dimensional sets, take points on a line. Um, that's a one dimensional set and it's just one direction. In that case, the direction set is zero dimensional. You cannot really say anything about the set of directions of a one dimensional set. You don't have any more hypotheses. It can be zero dimension. Um, okay, so uh, I'll describe quickly, uh, how do you use this discretized Marsh strand? Uh, kind of, the, the, it's uh, um, we know what we're looking for now. We know that we really like U by U squares for which the intersection is more than one dimensional. The intersection with P is more than one dimensional. You cannot really achieve this if you take a careless partition of the, of the, the original square with U by U squares. So you really want to do a more delicate decomposition into squares where the intersections are uh, one plus epsilon regular for some epsilon. The regularity is also called Frostman regularity. Um, and then using, using this discrete line my strand, we get many well-spaced lines in the square, in, in each uh, set of lines coming from the square. And with well-spaced lines, one can prove uh, an incidence lower bound rather quickly. Uh, so any set of points you give me and any <coughs> pens, I give you uh, uh, several pencils of lines where, uh, so you have a set of lines through uh, each point in pi, and the lines are well separated according to a condition like the one we saw. Something like that leads in immediately to, a, to an initial estimate lower bound. Uh, I use different notation because this is not the original config, the original P we'll consider. And in fact, uh, uh, it's not really, uh, they, they don't even have to be necessarily points in P. We have, remember we have these lines passing through. So we have these good squares uh, in some partition and we have lines from uh, um, 
So each square determines a set of lines. They don't necessarily pass through the same point, but they're rather close together. So uh, the, 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 we don't care about incidence between points and lines. We care about incidence between points and tubes at some scale. And um, if the scale eta is bigger than the, the parameter u for the side of the square, then I can assume I can pick this p for each square. I can pick a point inside, and I can pretend all my lines from each square are actually passing through some single point. They are separated, and uh, I can apply something like this. I get an initial lower bound for uh, at scale eta, the same scale for which I have the separation. Okay, I won't really get into numbers because I'm out of time. Uh, the, the twist that um, I was alluding to earlier uh, when answering Ryan's question is that um, uh, quite interestingly, initially disappointing, but quite interestingly, uh, this story so far only recovers the eight over seven bounds. So it really gives an alternative proof for the Komlosh pins uh, summary the exponent. Um, and uh, uh, there's a very good reason why it, it reaches this eight over seven. So uh, I promised I would tell you a bit about how this eight over seven is a natural limit of, uh, of road strategy. It is a limit of this combination of uh, high low with the initial estimate approach to finding small area triangles. So uh, we have essentially two ways to find small triangles in, in, in this proof. So we have this initial estimate and inductive strip strategy. But remember when you apply this high low upper bound, we can apply, we can go from one scale to another if the points are not too concentrated. So this is the error term is controlled. If the, 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 points are, the points and lines are not too concentrated. If they are, you have to zoom in and find a, a small square that contains three points. So you're you kind of combine it with this, this inductive kind of in the spirit of density increment type, type strategy. And uh, uh, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if the points, original points are well spaced, so uh, like for example, the set of points is homogeneous. Every, every, uh, every uh, square of the, these dimensions contains at most a constant number of points. So it's this point set is two dimensional roughly at all the way up to, all the way down to scale uh, one over root n. Then you can actually bypass this eight over seven. You can find a triangle of, here we add most that. It turns out this is not really the worst case for the combination of these two ways to find triangles. So the worst case turns out to be a two-dimensional set up to some scale and, uh, and uh, one-dimensional beyond that scale. And if you actually write down what, put, put some number here for you and uh, uh, calculate what, what should, uh, what, what, what the triangle area with, with the, with a hybrid situation like this give, it really recovers this eight over seven. Um, so I'll end by telling you the punchline for uh, getting a bit beyond eight over seven. So the main ingredient uh, is a remarkable recent theorem of Orponish, Merkin and Wang from uh, December or November last year. They proved this beautiful result right in time for us to, to use it. Um, so they show that you can actually say something about um, the set of directions of a set of points that's less than one dimensional if you assume that this set of points is not contained on a line, like in the pathological case I described. The set of directions, uh, well, okay, it's either one like before or, so if, if, if X has large dimension or at least it has dimension, at least the original dimension. So this is a, a, a a result that incorporates, relies on work against discretize some product theorem. In fact, it relies on uh, generalization of the result for the Fustenberg set problem that I mentioned uh, and, and uh, a few other nice ideas. It can also be regarded as a continuous analog of a pretty nice theorem over FP, Sony's theorem, that if I take a set in FP squared that has size at most P, then it contains at least this many distinct directions. So this is a theorem that originally was proved by Rede when A has size P uh, and was unclear how to go below P for a while. And so only uh, proved the result like this. Uh, so the point, the point is really to try to discretize this, uh, incorporate sets that are below one dimensional and uh, try to use 
uh, that information to get a better initial estimate. So to go to go to smaller scales. Uh, I won't uh, tell you about complications. There are several interesting, I guess, technicalities uh, about how to actually use this uh, discretized formulation. is not 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 so easy because of this. Uh, what what this hypothesis corresponds to in in, in the discretized setting, but. Uh, uh, I hope at least it gives you a sense of how these things fit together. So I'll end here. Thank you. That's seven six pi from the homogeneous to the seven six. We don't know. Probably not. Uh, it is an important exponent for this problem. Uh, so it's a it's a good question. It's a it's a limit. Uh, Oh, in some sense, a different limit for this problem to how much you can use the high load in this, this inductive, inductive step. Below seven over six, you would need to somehow do something else or maybe improve the high load estimate in a new, completely new way. Um, probably it is not high load. What do you believe? Are, are you convinced that my answer is more of an Yeah, I think short answer is we don't know. We had disagreements about this. Oh, uh, I think I believe that uh, the answer should pro would be nice if it's uh, one over n squared, again up to the log. Uh, but I wouldn't be shocked if it's three halves or something like that. I believe that would be nicer to be if it's three halves. Yeah, maybe it would be nicer. Exactly. So lower bounds would be a great problem to look at as well. Any other questions? Yeah. Question. I don't think it was a good answer. I don't think it was a three or more dimensions. Um, so this is a good question for Dima. He wrote a paper uh, about this recently. One can pose several several uh, variants of this problem. So I guess the, the, the more standard one, you can ask for the smallest volume of a tetrahedron determined by four points in, inside the, the unit cube, tetrahedron uh, simplex in the dimension. Uh, so there are some bounds known. I think for this problem, I mentioned we approved the, there's a tetrahedron of volume one over into the four thirds. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the best known result. One can also prove, uh, well, one can also ask intermediate questions. So we can ask still about uh, area of the smallest area triangle determined by n points in, in the unit cube in d dimensions. That's a more subtle problem. Uh, no non-trivial bounds are currently known for that. Somehow, just this pigeonhole from the beginning is yeah. the best. Work in progress. Work in progress. Yes. No more questions. Let's thank again.